I want to take this opportunity to introduce our guest speaker, our keynote luncheon speaker for today. And I want to tell you before I introduce him, uh, Jay Johnson flew all the way down here this morning. He's going to speak to us, and he's flying all the way back to the Pentagon this afternoon. So I've got to tell you, I really, really, really appreciate having the DOD General Counsel uh, do that for us. Commercial. Commercially. I'm sorry, commercially. <laughs> That's right. The Honorable J.C. Johnson uh, is the General Counsel of the Department of Defense. Having been nominated for that position by President Obama in January of last year and confirmed the very next month. So for those of you who are looking for long confirmation processes, it only took one month for the Senate to confirm this honorable man. He holds an undergraduate degree from Morehouse College in Atlanta in 1979 and a JD from Columbia Law School. Jay started out in private practice with a firm of Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison in New York, but left to serve for two years as an assistant United States attorney in a southern district of New York. He then returned to Paul Weiss where he became a partner in 1994. Four years later, Jay went back to work in the executive branch where he served for 24, 27 months, I'm sorry, as general counsel for the United States Air Force, the Department of the Air Force, and the Clinton administration. After that, he once again returned to private practice at Paul Weiss, where he was an active trial lawyer in large commercial cases. In testament to his skills in the courtroom in, 19, in 2004, I believe it was, he was elected a fellow in the prestigious American College of Trial Lawyers. Following the 2008 election, Mr. Johnson served on President-elect Obama's transition team prior to being nominated and confirmed into his present position. <coughs> I first met Mr. Johnson at a meeting of the ABA Standing Committee on Law and National Security. Uh, and I will tell you that everyone who has had contact with this gentleman, whether it be from the ABA or in executive branch or in private practice, will tell you that he is <clears throat> one of the best lawyers they've ever met. Uh, and I will only tell you personally that I think we should all be delighted that he gave up a very lucrative private practice to serve as the General Counsel for the Department of Defense. Jay, thank you for coming, and I turn the podium over to you. Um, thank you very much, Scott, and thank you for inviting me to this program. I very much wanted to be here. Um, <clears throat> Scott mentioned the uh, ABA Committee on Law and National Security. Uh, if anyone here is not involved with that committee, uh, I strongly encourage you to participate. It is remarkably informative and educational. Uh, I think it's one of the best bar committees I've ever been associated with. Um, the other thing that comes to mind about uh, the ABA committee is the experience I had last September speaking at a breakfast meeting of that committee. Um, whenever I give remarks in um, settings such as this in my, my current position, uh, first question I always want to know is who's my audience and is there going to be a camera there am I going to be on the internet uh, because for reasons that I haven't quite fully grasped yet all of a sudden people care what I think what I say and um, so uh, I spoke at this um, ABA committee breakfast on September 10th 2009 I gave prepared remarks because I knew the press was going to be there. C-SPAN was there, NPR was there, Washington Post, AP, about four other news organizations. And I was flattered that all these news organizations were showing up for my speech. And so I gave prepared remarks about the anniversary of 9-11 and what that meant for our country, what that meant for the evolution in national security law that had occurred since September 11, 2001 what it meant to me personally, having been in Manhattan on September 11, 2001, what I observed, what I experienced, I gave what I thought was a pretty good speech. And at the end of the speech, um, <clears throat> I, was, I was told by, uh, I can't remember who, you know, the press will be there and there's gonna be Q&A, but you don't have to call on the press if you don't want to. Just call on our membership. You don't have to call on the press. So I gave this speech and I was feeling pretty good so uh, an AP reporter stood up and wanted to ask her questions. I said, okay, I'll, I'll answer your question. And 
she asked me, Mr. Johnson, you said last summer at congressional testimony that uh, we were on track to meet the deadline to close Guantanamo Bay. Do you still say that now? It was September 2009. And I said to the reporter, no, that's not what I said. What I said was that we were on track in the EO mandated review process of each detainee and we are committed to the deadline to close Guantanamo. I repeated exactly what I said in four congressional committees in July 2009. So next day, headline, AP, nobody said a thing about my prepared remarks. Next day, <laughs> headline, Pentagon lawyer hedges on whether they can meet deadline. Um, it wasn't on C-SPAN, and you find out the most interesting thing about people based on who tells you they saw you on C-SPAN. Um, because if I, you know, somebody says, I saw you on C-SPAN, I mean, you were up at 2 a.m. in the morning watching C-SPAN 3? You know, get a life, please. And, um, I also want to pay a tribute to my former client, Guy Blinn, from uh, Winston-Salem. Um, <clears throat> Guy was deputy general counsel of R.J. Reynolds Tobacco. Uh, hired me in 2001. Um, it was um, an interesting experience. Um, many people have. Uh, many different opinions about uh, about tobacco companies, but uh, it was it was heartening and uh, worthwhile to represent a client that you know litigated on principle and defended litigation on principle. Um, and so um, it's good to see Guy Blinn again. Thank you for inviting me. I have. Um, I'm not going to give prepared remarks here. I'm just going to talk from notes. You, you all don't seem like a prepared remarks kind of crowd. Um, I have been uh, on the team with Barack Obama since um, November 2006. I've been part of his administration for 14 months, but I feel like I've been part of his team now for over three years. Uh, he recruited me to his campaign before it was a campaign in November 2006. I was one of the first former members of the Clinton administration to publicly sign on with Barack Obama. And so I've been on this ride for a little over three years now. And during the campaign, we formulated some of the national security legal positions that you see that are fundamental to this administration today. Uh, one place where that happened was um, in response to a set of questions put out by Charlie Savage, a journalist who was then working for the Boston Globe, and he put out a series of national security legal Q's and A's to all the candidates, and uh, the responses were, were interesting. Um, <clears throat> Rudy Giuliani's responses were, I'm not going to tell you anything, and um, Ron Paul's responses were, no, the government doesn't have the authority to do any of that. And um, we, <clears throat> in Senator Obama's responses, made a couple of very fundamental points. One is that th there was a question along the lines of, does the president have the power to commit troops uh, in defiance of an express statute from Congress? Does the president have the authority to, I'm not getting it exactly right, but does the president have authority to uh, command and direct certain troop levels at odds with what Congress tells him? Uh, does the president have authority as commander in chief under Article Two to commit troops into armed combat without authorization from Congress? The gist of the response from Senator Obama was, and he's a, he's a lawyer and a very good one and a former con law professor, the gist of his response was that, in general, the president, in committing the forces into hostilities, should act with the authorization, the express authorization of Congress, and not rely on an inherent Article II authority to, to make war around the world. Uh, this president bristles at the notion that if the president does it, it must be legal, and, of course, reserves the right um, to self-defend the nation, its people, 
uh, in certain exigent situations. But in general, this president believes that when we engage in armed conflict, we should do so in response to an express authorization from Congress. And you see that manifest in a number of different ways in the national security legal policy of this administration. I am <clears throat> I'm honored to be part of an administration that has made rule of law a cornerstone of its national security policy. And that fundamental belief of this president, we saw less than two months into office when a bunch of judges in Washington, D.C., who were managing the habeas cases brought by the Guantanamo detainees, asked us, there's this definition of unlawful enemy combatant by the prior administration. Would you like to refine that in some way? The other comment I'll make here, my other overarching observation that I want to share with you here, which is reflected here and in other things I will mention, is that not many of you may appreciate this, but a lot of the high-profile national security legal decisions that we in the Obama administration have had to make, and I suspect the same was true in the prior administration, were made in response to a court deadline. So because the issue was part of a litigation and a judge wanted something by a certain date, which was a forcing event to making a very difficult national security legal decision. So we have this thing called the March 13th definition of our detention authority. And the whole reason it's called the March 13th definition is because a district judge wanted it on March 13th, 2009, and wouldn't give us any more extensions. And so on March 13th, 2009, this administration uh, offered to the courts a new definition of what we believed to be our detention authority. And I would say the most significant difference between the definition we put forth and the prior definition was that the prior definition began with the words, at a minimum, the president has the authority to detain X, Y, and Z. In other words, resisting the notion that, uh, resisting any upward limit uh, and implicitly in reliance upon the president's commander-in-chief authority. Our definition, our March 13th definition, is much closer tied to the authorization for the use of military force, and that is the, the foundation for our armed conflict against al-Qaeda and its affiliates, and as informed by the law of war. That's how we like to say it, the AUMF as informed by the law of war. So you have the first sentence of the definition, which basically tracks the language of the AUMF, and then you have the second sentence of the definition, which is what we say the law of war informs in terms of the AUMF. So you have you know, part of al-Qaeda, the Taliban, uh, or substantially supported al-Qaeda and the Taliban, or associated forces. And so far, uh, I think we've had a good track record with that definition in litigation, in court, but it reflects the fundamental belief of this president and this administration that our, our direct action, our captures, should be pursuant to an express authorization from Congress. Uh, all of you know that uh, the president signed the uh, executive orders uh, on January 22, that mandated a number of things, the closure of Guantanamo, a detainee by detainee review of the Guantanamo population. Uh, that review is complete. I thought it was a robust, thorough review. Uh, Bob Litt sitting back there sat in on many of those sessions, as did I. Um, we have, by the way, uh, in this administration, uh, some of the brightest lawyers in the country, including, including Bob Litt. Uh, it's, it's, it's just fun to sit in a room with people like Bob Litt, Harold Coe, um, uh, Dan Meltzer, Bob Bauer, um, uh, Elena Kagan, David Barron, I could go on and on. It's just, it's just fun and educational to sit in a room with such bright people. Um, but um, the process we went through was, a, was, I think, a very good one because we had so many eyes on. We had presidential appointees from across the national security community of the government uh, looking at these files, looking at these files personally, 
And I think that you know we, we put people into the buckets of law of war, transfer, um, prosecute, and I think that the process uh, worked well, and I think that the decisions we made um, were, were good decisions. Um, I'm not going to predict that they are perfect decisions, but I think that they were good decisions. We, of course, have adopted the Army Field Manual to all interrogations conducted by any U.S. government personnel. Um, and um, in the summer last year, as all of you know, and I, I know this is your next panel, uh, we reformed uh, military commissions uh, with the administrative changes we made and the Military Commissions Act of 2009. Let me share with you how that process began, because I, I'm very proud of how we went through that reform process last summer. Um, <clears throat> during the transition uh, in the fall 2008, December, January, uh, when I was making the rounds as part of the DOD transition team and meeting with our Judge Advocates General, our outgoing general counsels, and I would ask, I would ask the TJAGs, I was asking the JAG community, how would you change military commissions? We in the administration had not yet embraced the idea of military commissions. We, were, we had left open the possibility in some of Senator Obama's speeches, but we had not embraced the idea yet. Uh, he opposed the Military Commissions Act of 06, but he was supportive of an earlier version of it. So I, I went around to the JAGs and I asked them, how would you change military commissions? And to their credit, um, they told me emphatically we would get rid of CID. We would get rid of statements taken as a result of cruel and human degrading treatment because it hurts the credibility of our process. As long as you, it, even in theory, permit the possibility of such statements coming into evidence. And so I put together a group within the Pentagon that consisted of JAG civilian lawyers, uh, in March 2009, and we quickly came to a consensus on five administrative rules changes that we could make without a change in law. We put them forward in May 2009, and it was right around the same time that the President decided that he would work with the Congress, and he announced this in his National Archive speech. He would work with the Congress, and we announced it in a, a motion to adjourn. We announced it in a motion to extend the suspension of commissions. Um, that he would work with the Congress to reform military commissions. And over the summer, uh, working with the Senate and House Armed Services Committee, uh, I testified four times in July alone. We developed what I believe are some very good reforms uh, to the process, including um, reiterating the ban on CID, um, establishing a more robust standard for the admission of hearsay, <coughs> chain of custody requirements. Uh, there was a reference in the last panel to chain of custody. Uh, I've tried cases in federal court. I've prosecuted cases in federal court. You know, people, there's a, a notion that the federal rules of evidence when it comes to chain of custody hearsay is first class and what's in the UCMJ or the Military Commission's manual is second class. Having tried lots of cases in federal court, I will tell you that the federal hearsay rule exceptions, uh, which don't contain any sort of reliability, trustworthiness standard, um, uh, very often eat up the rule. So for example, if, if, somebody, um, if somebody in Guy Blinn's company uh, writes on a cocktail napkin, um, cigarette is defective, and sticks it in a corporate file. Ah, business records, Your Honor. It's 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 not it's not hearsay. It's a hearsay exception. Business records, uh, and that person never has to get called as a witness. So, um, in military commissions now, we have a more robust reliability, uh, totality of circumstances standard that permits the judge to evaluate the reliability of what is being proffered as, as hearsay, which you frankly don't have in federal civilian court. So um, in addition, we came to a unanimous view among the JAG community with the administration, uh, with the Department of Justice, on a standard for voluntariness, the voluntariness of detainee statements. 
which I think is a good standard. It basically codifies the constitutional standard with a carve out for point of capture um, statements. Uh, and uh, we believe it's consistent with the Constitution. It's going to stand the test of time. It'll be sustainable. And as a testament to the process, it is a standard that we developed with the support of and the participation of our, our JAG community. Uh, we have appointed a new convening authority, Bruce McDonald, retired Navy TJAG, who I think is going to be terrific. Uh, we are in the process now of uh, looking for new appellate judges for the uh, Court of Military Commission Review. The new law requires that the civilian appellate judges on that court be Senate-confirmed presidential appointees. I am confident we are going to have some terrific people there. Uh, we have a new Chief Defense Counsel, uh, Marine Colonel Jeff Caldwell, who's going to be terrific. Uh, so, however the KSM issue plays out, uh, I am confident that the commission system we have in place uh, is credible, sustainable, and hopefully will um, stand the test of any uh, appellate court review or judicial challenge. Um, I wanted to make an observation also about um, the administration's decisions with regard to um, OLC opinions and the detainee photographs, which you all heard so much about last year. Uh, again, decisions made in the context of litigation. In fact, those two issues were made in the context of the same litigation brought by the ACLU in the Southern District of New York. With regard to the OLC opinions, we spent a lot of time thinking about this and made the decision to um, declassify the OLC opinions, assessing the, the litigation context, assessing where we were. And um, when it came to the detainee photos, where the district court and the circuit court had already told us we had to <coughs> provide them, um, we made the decision, the president made the decision, because he announced the decision, that we were going to fight that in court. Uh, because the president and the generals felt that making public these photographs, unlike the OLC opinions, would be volatile and constitute a threat to the force in forward deployed areas. Unlike an OLC opinion, photographs don't need translation. They have an immediate sensational impact around the world once they hit the internet. And we made a decision which some say was inconsistent with the decision about OLC opinions in that case um, because of the threat to the force. And so in response to people who say, well, you're being inconsistent, I would say no. When it comes to national security judgments, we make the best decision issue by issue uh, if a judge denied every single suppression motion he got, or granted every single suppression motion he got. You'd wonder about the wisdom of that decision making. And what the president said when he announced the decision on detainee photos was something along the lines of, the public already knows about detainee abuse. The public's already been educated about that. Disclosure of the photographs won't add to that debate. And I can speak to that. When we declassified the OLC opinions, I have actually used those opinions to help educate my lawyers, uh, taken them through the analysis, um, and I've used the OLC opinions as teachable moments, as the president would say, um, in contrast to the photographs, which I do not believe um, would do the same. And so along the way, the Congress undertook to craft a specific exemption in FOIA for the photographs. Um, I, first time I've been in a situation where I'm advising a client on litigation, and uh, I never advised a client before in litigation. You know, you can go to the Congress and get a bill that essentially says we win. Um, <laughs> but uh, that's what happened. And um, as long as the Secretary of Defense was willing to sign a certification that disclosure of these photographs would constitute a threat to <coughs> Americans abroad. Uh, he looked at all the photographs and um, signed the certification. 
And um, based on that one page piece of paper, the Supreme Court vacated the Second Circuit's decision. Um, so um, in both those instances, I, I felt that the decision we made was the right decision. Some would say they were inconsistent decisions, but when you're dealing with weighty issues of national security, um, consistency for the sake of consistency has its, its risk. Um, in my job, I wrestle with the, the topic of the last panel, um, cyber, um, and what constitutes uh, traditional military activity. Um, I have my views about TMA, and I think that we are working through some of the um, more difficult issues there. Um, I agree with what one of the panelists said, that we, we can't tell corporate America, you're not allowed to defend yourself, but we can't figure out how to defend you ourselves, um, and we need to work through some of these issues. Um, and I associate myself with some of the remarks General Alexander uh, made that I think were public today or yesterday. Um, Overall, we are, uh, as all of you know, in a, in a war against Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. Um, I think that we are doing what Senator Obama promised in the campaign, which is providing greater focus to Afghanistan, greater focus to the conflict against Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. I think we're making real progress there. I'm sure all of you read with interest the statements of the uh, CIA director in the Washington Post about a month ago on that. Um, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that uh, we face an evolving threat. And uh, Al-Qaeda is an increasingly decentralized organization um, that relies upon um, people um, not centrally located. Uh, as all of you saw on Christmas Day, um, they are making renewed efforts at attacking the homeland. Um, there is an effort to um, attack the homeland elsewhere and elsewhere as well. So we, we have to be cognizant of that. We have to be cognizant of the evolving nature of the threat. and. Um, as a national security lawyer, it's my job to, we lawyers are very good at devising advice based on a defined set of facts, based on a defined, the client brings us the problem. The client has already done the bad thing. And um, in national security law, we have to devise advice, strategy, policy for unknown evolving situations. And so that is, that is our challenge, that is, that is my challenge. Uh, I am, as all of you know, hopefully, a great supporter of our JAG community. I believe in our JAGs. Um, and uh, I am impressed every day by the work of our JAG community, particularly in forward deployed areas. Uh, I remember visiting a base in Afghanistan last year where uh, a suicide bomb had gone off just a few feet from this particular law office the windows were boarded up. Um, these lawyers were working 16-hour days. And I wanted to offer my support in, in any way I could. And so I said to each of them, you know, is there anything I can do for you back home? Are you having a problem meeting your CLE? Do you have your bar dues paid? You know, is there something I can do for you? And they, they all, to a person, said, we have everything we need, and, you know, we're, we're good to go, sir. And so um, it's remarkable to watch these young men and women uh, out there in the field doing the job that they've been ordered to do um, with an unbelievable level of, of dedication. I'm impressed by them every single day. So thank you for inviting me. And hopefully I'll have time for q and I, I think we do. Thank you, Dave. I'm told by Ren, that we have time for maybe one at most. Short questions because they literally have to get the car and ride back for that commercial flight back to Washington. Um, it's on the end of the back door. In the back. Yeah. 
If you could identify yourself, sir. Yes, I'm Bob Impulm. I'm with Citizens for Global Solutions. And one of the things we support is greater U.S. cooperation with the International Criminal Court. And I just wanted to express that one, I think one of the bases for our security is the rule of law, in particular international law, and get your view, because there are, uh, particularly from the defense and security community, some resistance to the United States fully participating in the ICC. And as a lawyer, I understand there are practical impediments to that. But I think this administration is much more cooperative with the ICC, and I wanted to get your view from the DOD perspective. Well, it's something we're actually about as recently as the meeting I had yesterday. Uh, can I answer a question with a question? What do you think of the crime of aggression? I think that one of the United States' proudest moments as a lawyer and a, and a fan of Robert Jackson was in 1947. We stood up and said, as a matter of principle, the war of aggression was a crime. And so I would hate to see the U.S. step back from that. But I appreciate that at the Kampala conference in May, we were in a difficult situation because we don't participate actively in the court. And yet they're going to take up this question. And so I think it may be that we should come out in favor of a clear definition of aggression, but not be entirely clear yet when and under what circumstances the jurisdiction of the court will apply. But I'd hate to see the U.S. step back from what we did, I think, so nobly in 1946. Well, I'm happy to continue that discussion with you. And if uh, hopefully you can give Colonel Gady your email address. Great, thank you. Okay. One short. Military commissions, procedural and evidentiary improvements, but we want them to be credible. Uh, as I understand it, they are still applied only against non-U.S. citizens. They're that perceived is the by the rest of the world as discriminatory. Uh, there's case law on that, as you know, in the United Kingdom. Uh, and with regard to the basic concept that the enemies of one country are to be tried by the military of that country, there's a a serious issue of the appearance of impartiality, which probably would not pass muster before the European Court of Human Rights. Again, a credibility issue. Do we really need these things? Why can't we go with a criminal trial that would have credibility on both counts? Uh, that is an issue that, that very issue, we, we considered last summer. The jurisdiction statement for military commissions, which the Congress put into law, is limited to non-U.S. citizens. Um, so it's not as if I, as an executive matter, an administrative matter, can expand the jurisdiction to, to cover U.S. citizens. Um, one comment I'll make in response to that question, but it's a broader comment, is that on something like military commissions, given the subject matter, the only way you get anything accomplished in Congress, in my experience, is through bipartisan reform. In other words, you start with the political center, the people who think a lot about these issues in the political center, and you build out. You can't do something like pass a new MCA with support entirely from the left or support entirely from the right. You just can't. And so the reforms we got were bipartisan, centrist, and through a robust coalition of people who think a lot about these issues. Now, when you have reform that starts from the political center, uh, people in one camp or the other can't get everything they want. So that's just the reality. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call it, uh, call it a day because I know he's got to get to the airport and Colonel Gady is going to hop in the car and take him. Jay, thank you so thank much you. for coming down, sir. We appreciate it. Again, with, with any of the crew. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We will be reconvening for a panel on military commissions versus trial in the federal courts at 2.15.